This is One on One. Yeah, he's back. We had him before, but now we have him at the uh, Performing Arts Center here. NJ Pack, Warren Zanes, writer, musician, educator. Good to see you, man. Thank you for having me. Uh, you still, are you, Tom Petty, you working on a bio? I'm working on a bio. Um, these things take a, a long time. Like the bio writer of the Rolling Stones, Keith Richards, went to him and said, that took longer to write than the <laughs> Bible. And I think I'm matching up. Tell folks uh, about Tom Petty, why it's worth that much time and why he's so interesting to you. Well, I, as a comparison point, Bruce Springsteen is a guy who, who knows how to situate himself for you. Tom Petty's a much quieter presence, but of the same generation, has had an enormous impact. You know, there are a lot of young people who identify quickly with Petty, even though he's in his 60s at this point. But I think they grew up in the, in the Renaissance period of rock and roll. And it really, American culture was changing at a, such a rapid rate, and rock and roll is such a big part of mm. it, that if you want to understand American history and American culture, these guys are very important. Where'd Springsteen, you up? Petty. Grew up in New Hampshire. Musical family. M musical family, but we, we weren't like the Von Trapp family in, in any respect. We weren't singing together until I joined my brother's band. Most important thing. Tell folks about your brother. Uh, my brother, well, we were in the Del Fuegos together yes. for about five years until uh, I left and we stopped talking. And <laughs> then we started talking again. But Fan he does family do that, right? music. Yeah, yeah f family and bands can really do that. Yeah, right? right? There's, there's a lot. Now, there. we had John and Bucky Pizzarelli in here earlier. You saw them, right? Yeah. They yeah. get along great. That's all fine. But that doesn't always, it doesn't always work that way, right? Well, they get along great in front of you, but I, <laughs> I just saw them arguing in the parking lot. They were fighting lot. in the parking lot, yeah. right? <laughs> but because Dan... Right? Yeah. That, that's he, your brother? The older brother. You're you know, kidding. Four years older, <laughs> you know. But it's, it's so interesting with your career because it's not just that you're a talented musician and writer, but you're an aficionado, aficionado on so many levels. But you also bring people into music and try to get people interested in music. Talk to yeah. folks about your background in that way. Yeah, well, a curator of this stuff. Yeah, I worked at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as their VP of Education and Programs, um, and I've I've always been writing about music since I started writing. But th I think the the two big threads are I played it, and I went and I got my PhD and started writing and teaching about it. Because and that mix. Why the second part? Um, because I was dating a young woman who was getting ready to dump me, and she said, you might be more interesting if you went to college. Why does it have to do with a woman? A woman? What, what's up with that? Well, Why it's, is that, it's, I was just walking through the entire plot of Homer's <laughs> Odyssey with someone, and it's all about a woman. If, if the story's worthwhile, there's a woman there. Thank you, Warren. Yeah. That is true. <laughs> um, interesting. Right now, your music. Describe as people evolve in their musical taste, would you describe where you are right now? Well, where, where I'm at right now is, as you say, I'm writing this Tom Petty book. I do some work in film. Just launched a big project with Stephen Van Zant from Bruce Springsteen's band. So I'm involved Talk in Talk about that Van Zant project. It's, it's a history of rock and roll curriculum geared toward middle and high school students, but really anyone can lose themselves. It's web-based, and you go to the website, it's teachrock.org. Teachrock, uh, guys, can we put that up? I know we're doing post-production. Teachrock.org, and what happens when you go on there? When you go there, there are lesson plans that are certainly geared toward the teacher, but there are a tremendous number of resources. So, you know, our, our thinking is with music, what people tend to do is, let's get instruments into kids' hands. When, when they, have film in the classroom or literature in the classroom, their first thought isn't, let's make them filmmakers, let's make them writers. They study the history of the medium. It doesn't happen as much with music. So with Stephen, what we're creating is a true history. It's more social studies than music-based. And so this is for kids who start to get drawn into popular music so that they can have a kind of sense for where it comes from, mm. because a lot of kids do not learn that. Why did Aretha Franklin's respect mean what it did when it came out? What was the context? And that's what we're really setting up. So when you go to this site, you'll see, among other things, 
you'll see Aretha on stage getting a cash box award, and there's Martin Luther King at her side. We have a clip from the Merv Griffin show of Martin Luther King on Merv Griffin's show, mm. talking about the civil rights in a context that you're not accustomed to seeing him. So it's a lot of rich historical materials, but a way to see that this music was not just an entertainment. It had all kinds of power to actually change the fabric of society. But you know what's so interesting to me as I listen to you talk about this, Warren, is that because we know each other from, uh, from our respective hometown, you know, Montclair, and around school functions, you know? I see you around and I think to myself, um, the little kids are around and you get little kids interested, the, you know, your own and yeah. others. And as you talk about music in such a frankly scholarly way, yeah. I ask myself, how does he make it accessible to younger kids who would potentially have a harder time accessing what you just described? Yeah. Because you do. Well, we, we, we start at middle school, so we're not at the elementary level, though I think we can get there. But here's the thing. I don't think I need to make it accessible to them because I think the music makes it accessible to them and then they start to get interested. They're, stu they're already studying things like the civil rights movement, the growth of the suburbs in post-war America. They have to look at that stuff in their mm -hmm. history classes. If I can provide a different portal onto those same subject matters and the portal involves popular music, they're gonna come to me before they go to, you know, frankly, a dry textbook. The potential for the internet, for social media, to help drive this interest in the kind of music we're talking about? Yeah, it's, it's huge, you know, obviously. We've partnered up with Scholastic to really kind of promote this and get it out there. But so much happens at that you know, it's crazy to call it a grassroots level, but it is a grassroots level on the internet. It's educator to educator, student to student. So you build this stuff, you work with partners like, you know, we've got ABC News, we've got Scholastic, we've got NYU. They help you, but then it's out there in that, in that world. And if you build something that's good, it's really got a shot. We did a lot of coverage on 25th and Stardom, a terrific movie. Um, I guess it premiered at Sundance, it won a lot of awards there, but also yep. our partners at the Montclair Film Festival, they premiered it last year. Yeah. Um, Darlene Love, and a lot of backup singers were featured. How did you yeah. get connected with that? I, I got connected because the producer, Gil Friesen, called his friend, Jan Wenner, who's the founder and editor of Rolling Stone, and um, editor, publisher, I mean, and Jan said, call Warren and talk to him about your idea, and Gil said, I wanna make a movie about backup singers. Now, you don't hear this typically. Usually it's, I want to make a film about, and then it's, you fill in the star's name. Right. It's Elton John. It's Sting. So from the get-go, Gil had an idea that was unconventional. And I felt like my role was to keep going to him and saying, why do you want to make this? Mm, good question. Be because if, if you can drill into that, I mean, it was very instinctual for him, but as we drilled in, he was coming up with more reasons why he wanted to do this. And in those reasons were the heart of the film. This is a story about women in music. Um, this is a story about gospel. This is a story about gospel music getting into popular arenas. You know, right. like with so much music has a gospel feel to it that you would never associate with the church. It was that story. It was the story of you know, living behind the star and really investing in an art despite the fact that you were destined to be anonymous. Yes. Like, does it stop meaning something because you're anonymous? And Still obviously the, the message is, no, it continues to mean something. Because there's a very talented, talented uh, backup singers. It's a great film. Yeah. By the way, speaking of talented uh, performers, you're going to be performing for us in just a couple yes. seconds. Yes. What are you going to be singing? I'm going to do a, a song from a record that I haven't recorded yet, but my, my last recording was my divorce record. So now <laughs> I've got to do a record of love songs because life carries on. Yes. And uh, this is called? Uh, this one's called What You Do. What You Do. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. See you in town. Thank you. You got 
my favorite eyes I love all that you say and what you do I love when you wake up and the clock's just hitting noon I love all that you say and what you do There's no one looking out for you No one watching me, won't you? Afraid to fall in love with you. I look into my eyes, won't you? I love it on the phone with you. I love the words you write. I love all that you say and what you do. What you do. One on One with Steve Adubato at NJ Pack has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence, and by the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, in cooperation with NJTV and 134WNET. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at NJ Pack has been provided by the law firm of Gibbons PC, Hackensack University Health Network, the Fidelco Group, Cone Resnick, Fedway Associates, New Jersey Natural Gas, and by Berkeley College. Promotional support provided by the Star Ledger and NJ.com. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.